Well, good afternoon, and welcome to the third interview in our second year of our six-week series of conversations with noted presidential historians about the American presidency. The series is brought to you by the LBJ Presidential Library and the UT Osher Lifelong Learning Institute and Humanities Texas. I'm Phil Barnes, and it's my privilege to chair the UT Holly Enrichment Committee. Dr. Mark Lawrence, the director of the LBJ Presidential Library, and himself a widely respected historian, is the host for each of these interviews. This year, we're focusing on presidential decisions for war and peace. And from these conversations, we are learning just how complex and often difficult these decisions were. And this week, we will see just how history may occasionally repeat itself. As a participant in this webinar, you may present questions throughout the program for our Q&A segment by using the Q&A function to write and submit them. Our Q&A host again today is my UT only colleague, Sandy Kress. Our special guest, Mark Silverstone, is Associate Professor in Presidential Studies at the University of Virginia. He also leads the acclaimed Presidential Recording Program at UVA's Miller Center, where he edits the White House tapes of Presidents Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon, an historically important function. Through his access to White House tapes and his thorough study of now unclassified communications, memoranda, documents, and other materials from the Kennedy administration, Mark has written the Kennedy withdrawal, Camelot, and the American commitment to Vietnam. This book will certainly be the definitive history of President Kennedy's decisions leading to an escalation in the war in Vietnam. He shows in detail how the president received and responded to plans prepared mainly by Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, providing for the withdrawal of American troops as advisors if, when and as the South Vietnamese Army succeeded in defeating the communist insurgents. Mark Silverstone shows that Kennedy declined to commit to any firm dates for the withdrawal, preferring always to keep his options open. His documented reluctance likely stemmed from conflicting reports about just how well the South Vietnam Army was actually performing. While the American press regularly reported on progress in defeating its enemy, now declassified documents reveal field reports of exactly the opposite, that the South Vietnam Army was not defeating the communists and likely could never do so. Of course, the president was assassinated and the withdrawal plan was subsequently abandoned. The South Vietnamese army never demonstrated its ability to defeat the insurgency, and to the extent that that was the criteria for withdrawing American troops, the withdrawal would not likely have been authorized, even if Kennedy had lived. That, of course, we can never know for sure. Now we have the opportunity to learn more about this remarkable period in presidential history from the author of this remarkable book. So with special pleasure, delighted to welcome for today's interview, Mark Silverstone, author of The Kennedy Withdrawal, Camelot and the American Commitment to Vietnam. And now to Mark Lawrence. <laughs> 
Thank you so much, Phil, and welcome everyone to this third in our series. Welcome especially to my friend and colleague, Professor Mark Silverstone. It's great to have you, Mark. And honestly, I can't think of a person better positioned to help us think about the fateful American decisions for war in Vietnam, surely one of the most uh, de most important decisions for war and peace uh, that has, of course, had profound consequences for American history ever since. Mark, thanks again for being with us. I'm thrilled to be here with you, Mark. Thanks for the invitation. Mark, I, I think most historians would agree that the key decisions for war in Vietnam came in the first half of 1965, but that the decision had really little in common with, you know, FDR's declaration of war, call for declaration of war in 1941, or Woodrow Wilson's in, in 1917. Instead, the, the decision to fight in Vietnam came about rather gradually and didn't involve a single moment of decision for war. Historians of the war, in fact, often explain American decision making by reaching back into the 1950s, or at least the early 1960s, to show how it was that American involvement escalated. And your your book provides a really deeply researched history of decision making about Vietnam in the undeniably pivotal Kennedy years from 1961 to 1963. And we, we want to, of course, get into the argument of your book and, and understand how you in, interpret Kennedy's behavior, a subject of great controversy over the years. But before we get there, take us back to this period in the early 1960s of American involvement in Vietnam. What was the situation in Vietnam as John F. Kennedy came into office in 1961? Well, Kennedy inherits um, a uh, not, not quite a war uh, yet, uh, although there is certainly uh, military action between the government of then President Go Dinh Diem of South Vietnam and a burgeoning and more uh, martial communist movement uh, in South Vietnam. Uh, recall that by 1954, the end of the Franco-Viet Minh War, that war that lasted uh, from 1946 on up, uh, the French who were uh, reimposing imperial control uh, were confronting uh, the combined forces of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, the nation that was founded in September 1945 by Ho Chi Minh, and then and and uh, communists that were allied with that state, and that war ends essentially in 1954 with an agreement uh, hashed out at Geneva for the regroupment of forces north and south of the 17th parallel, mm -hmm. essentially communist forces north of the 17th parallel and non-communist forces south. And from that period, 1954 to 1960, uh, which began with the French still in place in South Vietnam, although they would be de um, displaced over the next couple of years, the United States play an increasingly important role in supporting first Prime Minister Godin Ziem and then President Godin Ziem in making sure that he was able to sustain an independent non-communist entity initially so that uh, there would be a Southern Vietnam at the time of elections that were supposed to take place in 1956, elections that were to unify the country North and South, elections that, that actually never did take place. Uh, and uh, none of the great powers actually were too terribly upset about that. Certainly from the, the Western Allies perspective, they recognized that uh, any free and fair election would have resulted in a victory for Ho Chi Minh, uh, resulting in a mm -hmm. communist state at that point. But thereafter, uh, once ZM had proved his mettle in South Vietnam, um, battling against internal enemies, of which there were several. Uh, he seemed to be a man that the United States would pin its hopes on. Certainly that was the case uh, when the U.S. first supported him in 54, but even more so after uh, his his battles with, with his uh, local antagonists in 55 and then mm -hmm. into 56. And by 1957, when he comes to the United States, he's being hailed as the tough miracle man of Vietnam. And the United States has in many ways cast its lot with Ziem and his anti-communist regime or non-communist regime. John Kennedy being among those who were part of uh, a lobby 
uh, organization, the American Friends of Vietnam, who were stoutly supportive of ZM and his efforts uh, to sustain this non-communist entity. The Eisenhower administration between 54 and 60 pumps about $2 billion of aid into South Vietnam and, and very much keeps it afloat. And, mm -hmm. and without that aid, it's hard to imagine that that a Southern Vietnam slowly and surely becoming a state of Vietnam, uh, known formally as the Republic of Vietnam, uh, would have lasted. And, and so by the time that Kennedy um, wins the election in 1960 and then becomes president in 1961, there are a couple of additional developments that have taken place. ZM had launched a campaign against communists south of the 17th parallel, trying to wipe them out, and was doing a fairly good job of that, at which point decisions both south of the 17th parallel among communists living there, but particularly in Hanoi, north of the 17th parallel, decisions were made to go on the offensive because communist ranks were being so depleted. And uh, as a result of several of those decisions, particularly one at the tail end of 1960, new administrative structures are, are set in, uh, in, in motion, uh, particularly the National Liberation Front, which was a combined organization of communists and non-communists, but clearly dominated by the communists to carry on this uh, uh, this assault on uh, infrastructure, ZM's uh, governmental in infrastructure, and in an effort to unify the country under the communist flag. And that is what Kennedy confronts mm -hmm. uh, when he becomes president. The American military presence at the yep. time is minimal. There are only 685 uh, US military advisors in country. The maximum amount that's allowed under the Geneva Agreement of 1954, and it's a training mission that they're providing. Mm -hmm. They're trying to, to build up uh, a, a, a Southern Vietnam Army that was really kind of the, rem the remnant of the old Vietnamese National Army mm -hmm. that was fighting, fighting with the French during that period from 46 to 54. Uh, and it's it's not going particularly well. There are a host of challenges that we can talk about later, but mm -hmm. this is what Kennedy inherits. Uh, yeah. A mobilized, a mobilized communist movement that is really going on the offensive. So the war is escalating pretty dramatically as as John F. Kennedy steps into office. And then, again, just to help us set the stage here, tell us broadly how the war develops over Kennedy's uh, thousand days in office. Well, it 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 mushrooms on on all sides. Really, uh, mm -hmm. there's there's no doubt that Kennedy. Um, escalates the war, and oftentimes the word escalation is attached to Lyndon Johnson, and, mm -hmm. and for good reason. It's probably more accurate to describe what happens during the Johnson period as Americanization, certainly after uh, the summer of, of 1965, but there's no doubt that the United States under John F. Kennedy becomes much more deeply engaged uh, rhetorically. Uh, it becomes more deeply engaged in terms of the number of, of uh, servicemen that go to Vietnam, as I mentioned, uh, 685 at the time he comes into office. Uh, the actual figure is 16,732 mm -hmm. under Kennedy in 1963. And then a host of um, military supplies go in, fixed wing aircraft, helicopters, um, more and, and, and more uh, civilian advisors as well to help build up uh, the uh, the inf the uh, civ uh, civilian infrastructure and there are other private groups that go in too to to try to help mm -hmm. nation build as as it was called so from the perspective of America's engagement it escalates dramatically from the perspective I would say also of what's happening on the other side mm -hmm. um, there is a dramatic uh, um, there's a dramatic escalation as well. And as with the Americans, it, it happens over time. It is, a, um, I like the way you set this up because it really mm -hmm. is a process, the way that, that the war emerges. And uh, there had been some vigorous debate in Hanoi over whether uh, the NLF and its, its military arm, the People's Liberation Armed Forces, um, commonly known as the, the Viet Cong or VC, whether they should really go on the offensive or whether there should be um, more political agitation uh, uh, initially. Uh, the decision is made to, to go on the offensive. And, and not everybody in the Politburo, including Ho Chi Minh, agrees with that. But mm -hmm. by the time we get into the middle of 62, 
The United States is starting to throw more and more men in. And there are decisions made also in other capitals, including Beijing and Moscow, that um, maybe now is the time to help support Hanoi. And Hanoi is, is eagerly courting the Chinese at this point. And because of that burgeoning relationship, uh, which had been important as well in the Franco-Vietnam War, but becomes really important again here during the Kennedy period, the Chinese are able to, to send the, the right kinds of signals and the right kinds of, of materiel to uh, the North that allows uh, Lei Zuan, uh, mm -hmm. who is, is really the first among equals in, in North Vietnam at that point, Ho Chi Minh really um, steps back from kind of day-to-day -day operations of, of running the show by 1963. There is a much more aggressive um, posture that the North uh, adopts. Uh, and so the war is, is intensifying on, on both sides in, in the court, from the course of six, the middle of 62 uh, through the end of Kennedy's uh, thousand days in office. And Mark, your, your book provides such a terrific narrative of these developments that you were just describing, but it also targets a very specific question. Would JFK have withdrawn or somehow drawn down American forces in Vietnam if he had survived in the presidency for longer. And before we get to your answer to that question, which I promise will be the next one, tell us why that's such a controversial question that has hovered over the history of the Vietnam War for so long. Well, the Vietnam War uh, ended up being a calamity for the United States. Uh, and for uh, the people of Southeast Asia, um, most importantly. And it seemed uh, for many, for some at the time, uh, but more so for folks later on looking back, that had Kennedy remained in office and the country had the benefit of his judgment and prudence and circumspection uh, and, and political talent like he demonstrated, let's say, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, mm -hmm. he might have found a way out of this mess. And it was a mess, certainly, for John F. Kennedy during his time there. So, so part of this is, is, is how the story turns out, and it, mm -hmm. it turns out pretty poorly. And when you... Um, when you remove Kennedy from the equation and slot in Lyndon Johnson, oh, how interesting it is that at least for a short while, they are using the same batch of advisors. Mm -hmm. And it seems as though the war just um, mushrooms. It, it, it gets much larger, not so much in 1964, although Johnson did uh, deploy 7,000 additional troops at that time, but certainly from 1965 on. And wow, what an interesting political science experiment that might be. Yeah. What's mm -hmm. the difference between the two? And I think also because there is a sense that that JFK was such an attractive figure. And it's not just about Vietnam, it's about sure. America writ large. Johnson certainly is able to achieve so much domestically, um, extending the program that John F. Kennedy lays out. But because of who Johnson was and who Kennedy was, and we can talk about some of that later, mm -hmm. You know, there's some real question as to whether or not John, uh, JFK would have adopted the same policies that LBJ did, even though LBJ, yeah. let's say, in at least in December and January, December of 63 and January of 64, thought that he was simply continuing Kennedy's policies. Okay, so let's get to your answer to the big question. <laughs> would JFK have behaved differently from the way Lyndon Johnson ultimately behaved as president? Would he have withdrawn or taken steps toward the withdrawal of American forces? So I don't think that he would have done so in 1964. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it's hard to see him doing that. He himself said that, that he couldn't do that. Otherwise, they'd have a, another Joe McCarthy on their hands. Yeah. Uh, perhaps after re-election in 1965, uh, but even then, I'm not so sure, or at least um, for me, the, the jury is very much out at that point. And while I, I did not try to engage that question frontally in the book, mm -hmm. others have done so. Mm -hmm. 
um, with with some rigor as well. Uh, what I tried to do is figure out where JFK was when he went to Dallas in 63. But to my mind, what that says is that he was still committed to fighting this counterinsurgency. Uh, yep. And there's, I, I think there's pretty decent evidence to suggest that. At the same time, we do know that Kennedy had some real concerns about his South Vietnamese ally, both, both uh, during the ZM era, as well as the three weeks post ZM when he was still alive. He recognized the power of nationalism uh, coursing through the developing world, but certainly in, in Southeast Asia. He had gone on record repeatedly as a senator talking about the difficulty of defeating forces that are at the same time everywhere and nowhere, nowhere uh, and, and the power of, of nationalism in, in a Vietnamese setting. So there's some virtue in thinking that John F. Kennedy uh, would have thought twice about going big, but I don't think that's necessarily the right question is, is how might Kennedy have stayed engaged? Uh, mm -hmm. It's hard for me to see him sending in half a million troops as LBJ did, but it's not hard for me to see Kennedy trying to do, trying to continue on with what he had been doing, mm -hmm. which was uh, continuing to send sabotage teams uh, yep. north of the 17th parallel with trying to use covert operations as pinpricks no doubt, uh, unlikely to really inflict sufficient pain as people were talking about graduated mm -hmm. pressure, more and more pain, perhaps leading the the, the North and, and the NLF to, a, to the conference yeah. table. Uh, those were not effective, those mm -hmm. measures, but it didn't stop him from pursuing them. Uh, it's conceivable that Kennedy who was enamored of counterinsurgency and the work of, of Roger Hillsman, one of his advisors, who himself was enamored of various counterinsurgency tactics, might they have tried to do something like pursue an enclave approach where various um, pieces of territory in South Vietnam were to be defended as opposed to defending the entire country. Mm -hmm. And then we moved to the conference table at that point. So I, I see Kennedy remaining engaged, even militarily engaged. I don't see him doing what LBJ did, but I do see Kennedy as seeing um, uh, seeing it as important uh, for mm -hmm. the United States position in the world to remain a credible force. Mm -hmm. And to do that, I find it hard to believe that he would have have simply walked out. Now, mm -hmm. he may have moved uh, um, off the battlefield, let's say by 66 or 67, but that really depends upon mm -hmm. what the greater constellation of forces were in the world. And also uh, from a domestic perspective, mm -hmm. even though he would not run again, his brother likely would, well, how that all would have meant for a Robert F. Kennedy right. candidacy. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. It's a fascinating question. Uh, the counterfactual forces yeah. us to contend with situations as they were and to, and to, to think about these, these alignments. Uh, but the, the short answer yeah. is, you know, I still see him remaining engaged. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let, me, let me ask you an, another, even more unfair counterfactual. Is it possible to imagine measures short of the big escalation that LBJ undertook in 1965 actually um, preventing a defeat of the South Vietnamese regime? Or was the situation simply so desperate that only the introduction of American forces at the level where LBJ escalated them could have really achieved that result? So to preserve a, an independent non-communist South Vietnam, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't think that uh, that the kinds of things that I was just laying out, mm -hmm. or anything short of of Americanization, mm -hmm. uh, would have worked. Uh, and and of course, in thinking about what these contingencies were, what would uh, what would the, the the political environment bear? Um, right. Certainly mm -hmm. in, in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, 
if you're thinking about the kinds of numbers that people were throwing around, uh, even at the time that Johnson was thinking about Americanization in the summer months of, of uh, 65, 10 to one ratios, 12 to one ratios uh, to combat a, a counterinsurgency. Yeah. You, know, you would need a million American troops or more. Uh, and 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 then what? Um, especially because of what we know was the the um, uh, the counterproductive activities of mm -hmm. many American forces in the way that that seemingly generated more communists than 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 killed them. Sure. Uh, so uh, I, I I I'm not really sure mm -hmm. that. Uh, that anything less than Americanization would have worked and right. anything greater than LBJ's Americanization mm. probably would have, have spawned uh, at least as difficult dynamics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Um, Mark, you're such a meticulous historian in your use of sources. And of course, nobody on the planet, I think, knows the audio recordings as, as well as you do. What Take us into the evidence for a minute. What is the strongest evidence that a historian could reasonably offer to suggest that, look, the Kennedy, maybe not JFK himself, but the administration more generally, was really getting pretty frustrated by Vietnam and was seriously contemplating finding a way to wind down the war? Well, some of that evidence comes from uh, textual evidence, evidence mm -hmm. that that we'd had for a while before the tapes became uh, even available. Uh, so for me, it was interesting to see, and, and it, I'm hardly the first person to, to notice this. Uh, there were many before me who, who've written on withdrawal and who've written mm -hmm. on, on escalation as well, that Kennedy in April of 1962 indicates uh, to Averill Harriman, I believe, uh, that that we really should be looking for a way to, 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 um, to wind down the American presence in mm -hmm. South Vietnam when the opportunity arises. Uh, and, and that presence had had expanded, as, as I mentioned at the outset, during the course of 1961. By the end of the year, we have 3,000 advisors. By the end of 62, there'd be 9,000 advisors. But here in this, this early part of, 1961, of 1962, April, after the um, Military Assistance Command Vietnam was stood up, which was this um, more robust um, military organization that was to conduct um, really um, the advice function that the Americans were providing to the South Vietnamese. Kennedy is thinking, okay, we've done this, but uh, but we should also think about the mm -hmm. bottom end of that trajectory as well. And that's what Robert McNamara uh, presumably listens to and fastens on uh, when he decides that he is going to initiate planning for a withdrawal of American troops. And that planning commences in the summer of, of 1962. Mm -hmm. The first iteration of a plan to get the United States out is tabled in January of 1963. It goes through several iterations into the spring. McNamara thinks that the planning actually results in American forces coming out too slowly. He wants to accelerate the process. Uh, and there, uh, and MACV and the, the Pentagon uh, go through those gyrations over the course of the summer. And, and then in, in the fall of 1962, McNamara and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Maxwell Taylor, present Kennedy with that plan uh, just after they come back from a fact-finding mission to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And the plan builds upon a much larger effort, a comprehensive plan uh, that was supposed to really coordinate all the, the various American yeah. um, activities in, in South Vietnam. But, but importantly, uh, it includes this projection yeah. that the United States will be able to get out of Vietnam by the end of 1965 and to accelerate the process and really to send a signal to all sides uh, the United States was going to try to withdraw a thousand troops by the end of 1963. So there's really there's good evidence mm -hmm, to suggest mm -hmm. that planning for mm -hmm. withdrawal was ongoing, right? Um, and it was that planning was real. It was mm -hmm. systematic, uh, and there was a, a lot of man hours put into that. But the implementation of those ideas depended on improvement of the battlefield situation. At the end of the day. Yeah, I think I think they did. They did. Uh, mm -hmm. That's yeah. certainly how it's framed. During right. the course of of the planning itself, uh, mm. that's coming directly from McNamara and others, yep. certainly how the military was conceiving of it. Um, but by the 
by the time that McNamara delivers this plan to Kennedy in October, he's not so sure. Mm -hmm. And he's getting he's getting very antsy, particularly because of what he's seen, uh, the mm -hmm. interviews he's conducted in yeah. South Vietnam when he's there. And allegedly, and we know this from from British sources, and and um, you mentioned sources, I was able to go mm -hmm. uh, to uh, the you know the PRO or the National Archives in England. It was is an, an interesting way to to kind of get some perspective on what the Americans were thinking about. And and one of those those sources indicated that the McNamara Taylor report that Kennedy receives in in uh, early October would have been um, much more downcast mm -hmm. uh, and tougher had the administration not wanted to use it as a way to continue to pry funds out of Congress. Uh, right. ways, mm -hmm. That was part of the, mm -hmm. the rationale. And for Kennedy, it's explicitly part of the oh. rationale. When he sends McNamara and Taylor to Vietnam, the foreign aid budgets get cut. Vietnam is, is, uh, is a four-letter word in, in American mm -hmm. parlance at the time because of what had happened over the course of the 63 and the Buddhist crisis and the appearance of the Americans supporting a religiously repressive regime. Congress was really raking Vietnam over the coals, and McNamara and Taylor were trying to to present both Kennedy and the American public with a way to continue to prosecute the war, but to do so for Kennedy then no. uh, and the public in a limited fashion. This is not a bottomless pit. There's there's a way that we can get out of there. And just to to finish this bit here, mm. this plan that that McNamara and Taylor deliver to Kennedy, of course, much of it is secret. But the timetable for withdrawal out by 65 and 1,063, yep. that's public. Yep. That's announced to the country. And yep. that's important. Mark, let's talk a little bit about the two presidents, um, JFK and, and LBJ. Um, some historians over the years who have attached most importance to this idea that JFK was seriously considering withdrawal have tended to characterize Kennedy as an unusual, maybe unique Cold War president and have uh, argued that Kennedy had a particular, you, you mentioned this, in fact, a few minutes ago, had a particular sensitivity to nationalism in the third world, had a, had a keen sense of the limits on American power, perhaps, in, in contrast to other Cold War presidents, and most especially in contrast to Lyndon Johnson. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your sense of JFK and the extent to which there's anything to this idea that he was exceptional among Cold War presidents. Uh, it's a great question, uh, and uh, especially because, as I mentioned, that political science experiment is mm -hmm. so fascinating. You, you take out one of these two figures. I think there is something to the notion that Kennedy was different than LBJ. Um, exceptional uh, within the confines of Cold War presidents, perhaps at that time. Mm -hmm. But of course, he never would have been elected had he not had many of those Cold War or or adopted the Cold War frame yep. that was, I think, essential for anybody running for elective office uh, at, at that point in time. That said, uh, he is certainly somebody who seems very willing to consider contrasting opinions, who welcomes debate, who is eager to kind of set policy advisors off against each other and to hear people um, make their case and then to choose the best route uh, after, after hearing them out. He's comfortable that way. He's comfortable with conflict even. And that seems to be a pretty important characteristic in a chief executive, somebody who's willing to listen to several sides, if, if not, not all sides. Uh, Lyndon Johnson didn't seem to operate that way. You know, it'd mm. be great if we had uh, meeting tapes from LBJ for the 1963-1964 period, mm -hmm. um, as we had with Kennedy in the 62 and 63 period. Obviously, we have we have the telephone tapes with, with Johnson, and you can hear him batting back and forth uh, these matters on on Vietnam. But it's a, it's a bilateral um, conversation. And for the most part, we know, and and you um, uh, better than anyone I've seen recently has has also addressed this in in, mm -hmm. in your most recent book on 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 Johnson, 
comparing and contrasting the two. Mm -hmm. um, Johnson is uh, Johnson doesn't like to be presented with dissent. He 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 wants his advisors to kind of work out a position and then deliver it to him. Um, he likes to work with like-minded people. Um, he's most comfortable that way. Um, perhaps that's particularly true of LBJ in, in uh, with respect to foreign affairs as opposed to do domestic affairs. But Johnson certainly seemed to be uncomfortable with that kind of verbal give and take uh, in the way that JFK was not. Um, JFK seemed to be more comfortable with the presence of um, of neutralists uh, mm -hmm. out there in the world, was willing to work with them, uh, saw value even in working with communist regimes if they were not closely allied with uh, Moscow. And that was that seemed to be the case where Kennedy was moving in 1963 with respect to Cuba. Um, mm -hmm. Cuba might not renounce its communist orientation, but as right. long as it renounced its fealty to Moscow, all things were possible. Mm -hmm. And that's not something that LBJ would have counted. It's, so there does seem to be a, a, a real difference between the two. Um, and, and just uh, going a little bit deeper on LBJ, it seems to me we now know, thanks to a lot of terrific research and writing in the last really 20, 25 years now, that LBJ was hearing all the time about the difficulties that the United States would face if it chose to fight a big war in Vietnam. And he was being urged from members of Congress, from members of his own administration, from foreign leaders, oh, please don't do this, right? There are alternatives out there. Uh, this is going to be a, a mess, right? If you really go all out in Vietnam. Um, could LBJ reasonably have listened to that kind of advice? Perhaps we could say with the benefit of hindsight, he should have, but could he, under the circumstances, given the pressures that weighed on him, geostrategic or political or, or other things, have, have realistically chosen a path other than the one he did choose to do what he believed was necessary to prevent the loss of South Vietnam? Yeah. I think in 1964, it would have been really hard. Mm -hmm. at, at, let's start there, at least. Yeah, sure. Carrying on for, for JFK. Let us continue his watchwords uh, in his first remarks to Congress uh, following the assassination. Uh, he's got his work cut out for him in trying to realize elements of, of uh, Kennedy's agenda that were still outstanding. He's trying to realize some of his own uh, pet projects as well, particularly with respect to the war on poverty so that he can run on that uh, come November, 1964. Mm -hmm. And he believes that he's essentially carrying through on, on Kennedy's policy in Vietnam, which is supporting the, the South Vietnamese in its effort to remain, uh, in, in their effort to re remain independent. And mm -hmm. since um, in, in many ways uh, he was getting outflanked on the right, you know, he didn't have to go all the way out on the right, but, but he takes action in the summer of 1964 after the, the Tonkin Gulf incidents to show uh, the American flag, the United States is not gonna get pushed around. We're going to stand up for our, our allies. No. You know, it's hard to see JFK having done something very much different. Now, it, it's it's open to, to speculation whether Kennedy would have opted for the same types of instrument that, that Johnson did, the legislative instrument, the congressional mm -hmm. resolution in, um, in, in August of 1964. It came easily to Johnson. He did something similar with Eisenhower back in the 50s. Made sense given who Johnson was to, to do something like that. But I, I yes, I, I see it hard for Johnson to have done something very much differently in 1964. Mm -hmm. By the time you get to 1965, uh, as as you know well, and 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 many of of, of the viewers do as as well, probably there is this moment after Johnson has won an extraordinary electoral and, and popular vote victory, that there may be opportunities for new departures. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Johnson's vice president, Hubert Humphrey, describes this period as that of minimum political risk. Here's Johnson's opportunity mm -hmm. to move in a different direction. And had LBJ not been LBJ, mm -hmm. um, perhaps there would have been an opportunity to do so. But because of who he was, because of his concerns about 
um, what our friend Fred Logewall right. calls credibility cubed, uh, yeah. you know, personal credibility as well as partisan and geopolitical credibility. It was very hard for Johnson, mm -hmm. as he himself would say, to tuck tail and come home running mm -hmm. uh, with his tail between his legs, um, as he just talked about with with yeah. Richard Russell. He'd be impeached yeah. if, if he decided to do that. Uh, and then, as he would later say to Gene yeah. McCarthy in February of '66, "I I can't get out." I just can't be the architect of surrender. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, to, to, to mm -hmm. then put John F. Kennedy in that position, it's hard to see Kennedy saying something like mm -hmm. that, um, given Kennedy's willingness to opt for, let's say, the, the diplomatic option with respect to Laos. You know, and, yeah. and think about what Kennedy, Kennedy had done uh, proving his bona fides, certainly coming through the fires of the, of the missile crash in 62. Mm -hmm. uh, here is somebody who was willing to to go to the conference table to try to to achieve what's possible out of a difficult situation. And of course, by 64, Laos was unraveling as well. So, you know, would he have been able to use that as an example in 65, 66? Mm -hmm. It's hard to say. But there would likely have been um, uh, greater comfort yeah. in considering that option than we saw from LBJ. What's your sense of that advice that Hubert Humphrey famously gave to LBJ in February of 1965? This is the moment of minimal political risk, right? The, as you say, Johnson had just scored one of the biggest electoral triumphs in American history. He essentially counsels his boss at the top of the ticket, look, don't worry so much about the right wing. What you really need to worry about are the people actually elected you into office. And this is all in service of an argument to re really rethink the escalatory pattern um, that was leading to a bigger and bigger war in Vietnam. Was 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 Humphrey right in well, his in his uh his advice? Yeah, it it, it doesn't seem that that um Americans, the uh the you know the chattering classes as well were were interested in going big in Vietnam at the time. I don't think anybody was was really interested in in vacating the field. Mm. Uh and again as as our 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 friends in the field have, have indicated um, Johnson wasn't getting pressured to Americanize heavily at at this point um, from external sources, and, and much of that was coming from Johnson himself. At the same time, it is Johnson's perspective, being the political genius that he was, that that I know what's going to happen if we decide to move in a different direction. That that our allies in Asia and even in Europe are going to get scared about what this means. And I would say that, that this happens to Kennedy too in, 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 uh, in late 63, that uh, the administration is getting word because of the test ban treaty, because of what Kennedy had said about looking to get out of Vietnam by 1965. Um, the Taiwanese are concerned that this means the United States is is kind of calling it quits on the Cold War. The South Koreans are concerned. The Thais are concerned. I mean, it, it, it's really quite interesting to hear them say those kinds of things. Um, and then you think about LBJ as well here in, in, in 1965. So Johnson is thinking that hmm. if we do decide to move in that direction, there will be a great hue and cry, even though it's not evident right now. Mm -hmm. And particularly if Johnson wants to to get all the, the funds that he can for his domestic right. program, as he says, Everett Dirksen won't give me a dollar mm -hmm. uh, if mm -hmm. we move out. So, mm -hmm. so it's Johnson looking into his crystal ball saying, yeah. I can see things mm -hmm. that may not be apparent right now, but I know that they're going to come up. Yeah, yeah. Well, very well put. Um, Mark, thinking very broadly from, say, 1945 all the way down to 1965, were there moments, maybe maybe not the, the Kennedy moment, but were there moments where the United States might have taken an off-ramp from the escalatory process that played out across really two decades? Yeah, um, other other paths. Uh, mm -hmm. I suppose the first would have been 45, 46 mm -hmm. uh, in the decision to allow, um, to acquiesce uh, in the uh, 
in the reinsertion, the redeployment of, of French troops, uh, which was something that really the, the, the British in, in many ways were responsible for, but the United States didn't um, didn't throw uh, wrenches into that process, uh, largely because there was de a desire at, at the end of the war to make sure that uh, we would have an, a strong ally on, on the continent of Europe as an anti-communist bulwark, and given the concerns, uh, the emerging concerns about what the geopolitical alignment was, was turning into 46 and then into 47, you can understand that. But it certainly put in train uh, dynamics that that led to that that mm -hmm. first war. Initially, that war looked like a, an anti-colonial conflict as much as an anti-communist one, and it wouldn't really come until the latter latter part of the 1940s, um, because largely the French were, were willing to magnify it in that ways, but also because of activities that were taking place in the communist world as well, that, that the United States started, started to see it as an anti-communist um, uh, campaign. And as the, the Cold War really solidified, um, it, was, it would have been hard to have seen the United States not support the French in that effort, even though there were efforts made to condition the way that the French were, conf were fighting that war. Um, Truman administration was pushing the French to grant independence much more fulsomely and uh, more energetically quicker. Mm -hmm. John F. Kennedy did the same thing. And perhaps that might have forestalled um, a greater conflagration later on. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what the diplomacy would have been, but it, but it, it would have reshuffled the deck for sure. Once that war expands after the Chinese are providing more and more support to the Vietnamese communists in 1950, and then the, the, um, it, it grants to an unsuccessful conclusion for mm -hmm. the French in 54, then the question is, what does the United States do then, particularly with ZM, and particularly as ZM himself seems to be a failing force uh, yeah. in the fall of 54, but then even more so in the spring of 55, when for a moment, it looks like the United States is willing to pull back from supporting Godin ZM as the standard bearer for Western interests in Vietnam uh, for, a, for a host of reasons. Um, might they have pushed for a different uh, cast of characters mm -hmm. that might have actually pursued a, uh, a, an election in 1956? Uh, and yes, there would have been a, a communist regime in in. Uh, in a unified Vietnam, but there was a communist regime in, in Yugoslavia that the United States seemed to be working with at the time after the, the Tito-Stalin mm -hmm. split of 48, and there were some opportunities there. Um, it, it would have been easier to see John F. Kennedy making hay of that, yeah. more so than Dwight Eisenhower. But yeah, so those are, those are kind of the hinge points, mm -hmm. I, I think, mm -hmm. as we move closer toward the, the Kennedy administration. Mark, let me pause here just for one minute to remind all of those who are um, watching today that they have the opportunity to add questions to the Q&A. Uh, you'll see that uh, little button down at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So please, I see some questions there already, which is fantastic. Uh, please go ahead and add more um, as, as I'm finishing up with Mark and then, of course, during the Q&A session itself. Mark, let me just let me just ask you one more before turning it over to Sandy Kress and to those questions. What are the, the, the lessons of the long period of escalation in Vietnam for how we might think about geopolitics today, but perhaps especially the period that you have written about so authoritatively? Well, it's... Uh... As you know, playing playing these 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 kinds of games or or or, or teasing lessons out of, of a conflict such as this and applying them to others is is really tough. Uh, and particularly today, when we're seeing uh, the war in Ukraine, uh, which seems to be a, a different kind of a conflict. Um, the if you want to talk about patron client relationships, the United States and South Vietnam, the United States and 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 Kiev. Uh, certainly on the other side of the fence, uh, during the 1960s, we were not facing a nuclear power. 
uh, and I think that, that that changes a lot of things. Uh, so it, it is you know one of a number of things that are, are quite different. On the other hand, I think to think back on the Vietnam experience and what was important there uh, and what you would want to look for going forward in decision making for war, I think you want to have a pretty well thought out process for how one decides on the strategy to be employed, on the kinds of priorities that you're placing upon that particular piece of territory uh, in the context of your global strategy. So something like that really didn't take place in the Kennedy administration with mm -hmm. anything like the, the vigor that it, it should have. Uh, Kennedy didn't really prioritize uh, in, in that respect. He never he never did pursue the writing of a basic national security policy, and, and there are, are decent reasons for that, but that kind of planning and, and really systematic thoughtful approach to, to how we organize our, our approach to global affairs uh, wasn't apparent, even though he was operating under some recognizable principles. So I think that the need to prioritize is important, the need to align uh, your program with the right kinds of people, the need to make sure that your, your decision-making process floats all, all these ideas up to the president in a systematic fashion is important. That goes to some of the stuff that we talked about regarding LBJ and and him kind of closing himself off mm -hmm. uh, ultimately with the, the, the big three, with Rusk and, and McNamara and Bundy and, and the Tuesday lunches and, and all the really big decisions being made among a, a very small number of people. And, and that's not healthy. For mm -hmm. uh, for for wise decisions, uh, so you know I I think priorities, um, personnel, surrounding yourself with people who are willing to be contrary, I think that's essential. I think mm -hmm. politics taking account of that is really important, but particularly for LBJ in 1964, politics seemed to dominate, and that seemed to override much of. Of, of his approach to Vietnam during the course of the year. And as others have said, politics can be the enemy of strategy. I don't think you can remove politics from the game given the, the nature of, of the process, uh, but it sure would be helpful if we could try to figure out a way to put it in its place when we're thinking about uh, the pursuit of America's vital interests abroad. Well, Mark, for my part, I want to thank you very sincerely for spending time with us this afternoon and, and uh, having such a fascinating conversation with me. Um, and I want to congratulate you as well on the Kennedy withdrawal, Camelot and the American Commitment to Vietnam, which has uh, been published very recently um, by Harvard University Press. Mark, thanks again. Really well, appreciate it. That's fa fantastic. Really appreciate your uh, being with us and your uh uh, answering Mark's questions is, is fantastic uh, for all of us to be able to be educated by you in this way. Um, I want to uh, I want to maybe pick up where Mark left off uh, by looking back on it. We'll get back into that time frame, but we have a couple of questions uh, of people who are looking back from now, back on it. And you look at Southeast Asia, uh, it's friendly, it's a, a market-oriented economy. Uh, golly, people are traveling there right and left from here. Uh, what, did, was this just judged badly uh, that at the time? I mean, Ho Chi Minh obviously had an association with Russia and China and was supported, but could he have been negotiated away? one of our uh, audience asks, and uh, George Gibbs asked, was this just bad strategic thinking? As it played out, it certainly appears to be. Yeah, the, the opportunity to to woo Ho, let's say, uh, uh, out of, of the communist orbit as, a, as a, a potential lost opportunity is is a question that, that scholars have thought about uh, for a long time. Uh, 
the opportunity for doing so, the window for doing so, uh, seems to have been upon reflection fairly narrow. Uh, really the late 1940s seems to have been the moment. Uh, Ho Chi Minh, yes, begins his, uh, his speech on the 2nd of September, 1945, when he uh, proclaims the founding of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam with the words of Thomas Jefferson. Uh, and there was an affinity for the United States, uh, an understanding of American history. The OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, was working with Ho and Vietnamese communists to rescue down flyers in China during the, the latter stages of the war, 44 into 45. And there might have been some opportunity, as people would say later, uh, of course, this is a bit acronistic, but to, to see Ho as an Asian Tito. As right. somebody who, who could have been uh, uh, wooed uh, out of Moscow's orbit. As I said, the, the, the scholarship seems to suggest that opportunities for that really kind of ended by the late 1940s. Uh, and, and after that, there was much closer coordination and cooperation, and particularly with the Chinese uh, after 1950, uh, after uh, the People's Republic was founded uh, the, the fall of the October prior, and then uh, both the PRC and the Soviet Union recognize uh, the DRV. I think we're in a very different situation at that point. So a lost opportunity, perhaps, but again, the opportunity to, to take advantage of that was, was pretty slim. After that, yeah. Yeah. Let me, uh, I want to, I want to go back in time and get into uh, John F. Kennedy's head. Uh, I've read so many in your work and in others, so many different thoughts he had uh, going back before he was president. Uh, obviously a concern that it seems he and President Johnson had obviously being called soft on communism. Uh, and yet he says, uh, uh, he's quoted when a congressman no amount of U.S. military assistance uh, would conquer an enemy, which is everywhere and at the same time nowhere. Uh, and yet, then he comes along and says to a con to a reporter as he's about to become president, Vietnam is the place for a win. Um, and then he hems himself in in the inaugural address, we shall pay uh, any price, uh, bear any burden. Uh, all of that seems to me to be a little bit uh, of a muddle, uh, straighten me out as to where he really was uh, as he's beginning to think about it as president. Well, I, I think John Kennedy thinks about it as a cold warrior. Uh, yes, he is under, uh, uh, he understands the dynamics of the developing world uh, as so many nations were getting out from under the the colonial yoke. Uh, decolonization was a fact of life, and it was going to spread throughout the 1950s into the 1960s, particularly in the year 1960. Um, Kennedy described the 1960s as the development decade. Uh, this was going to be the decade of these, these lands, and it was going to be important to pay attention to the words of the people, to uh, uh, to listen to their feet. Um, uh, he was particularly attuned to the coursing of history in, in that way. At the same time, uh, he recognized the importance of the Cold War struggle, which he saw as an existential struggle. And I, I believe he held to that very sincerely. And, and as he is setting his sights on national office, uh, Andrews, Congress in 1946. He runs for the Senate in 1952. Uh, he uh, almost gets the vice presidential nod in 1956, and, and he's thinking uh, about bigger game after that. Yes, his, his rhetoric becomes increasingly hawkish, but it's still hawkish, I think, on Vietnam. It is the keystone to the arch. It is the finger in the dike, he's saying in 1954. As senator, with a, with a national profile, to be sure. And I, I, I do believe that he believes that. So I think that, yes, Kennedy perhaps tailors his rhetoric a little bit for national office, understanding the tenor of the times. 
but I do think he approaches national office as a as a cold warrior. But it doesn't mean that he's a knee jerk reflexive cold warrior. Right. Um, that he's going to adopt the kinds of policies that he adopted previously, um, and that that other Democrats had had, had adopted. Uh, he is is going to consider the possibility, as, as we talked about before, of of working with neutral regimes, of working with even communist regimes, um, playing for time. Uh, and that was always Kennedy's hope that that he himself personally could play for time, but that the country could play for time. The problem was uh, they were in the hour of maximum danger, uh, as he said during his first address to the nation uh, at the end of, of uh, January 1961 in a really kind of bracing address. Uh, it's a very dangerous moment, uh, and he is approaching it with all due understanding of, of the nuclear uh, sort of Damocles. And that's really what he's hanging over our heads. And that's really what he's, he's focused on most intently. Uh, but I, I see Kennedy as a, a sincere cold warrior at that point. Certainly he held fast to those anti-communist principles. Uh, uh, but at the same time, he recognized uh, and he was flexible enough to think that, you know, Maybe there are some opportunities to to work with with those who are not explicitly our adversaries, or to try to peel some of them off from each other. Uh, Mike Watkins asked whether the summit with Khrushchev that didn't go so well, whether that uh, affected uh, his view here, whether it made him feel that uh, he had to push back or stand up more in Vietnam. Uh, as a result of, of the difficulty or the problem of that summit? That certainly seems to be the case. I mean, the word, what he says to, to New York Times journalist James Reston as he's coming out of one of those sessions with Khrushchev uh, at Vienna in June of 1961 is that Khrushchev just battered him and we now have the problem of making our credibility known uh, and Vietnam is the place. Yeah, and, and he says that in the context of not just the conversation with Khrushchev, but what had happened a couple months earlier uh, at the Bay of Pigs in Cuba, uh, also with discussions uh, ongoing with the Soviets uh, about Laos and neutralizing that country. Uh, one of the really only bright spots to come out of that that summit with with Khrushchev. Uh, Vietnam is the place. Uh, 1961 would continue to be tough for Kennedy. Uh, the Berlin Wall goes up in August. There is a, a tank crisis at Checkpoint Charlie in October of 1961. And at some point during that time, and it's it's unclear really when, uh, and, and this is where, uh, and Mark Lawrence will know this and other scholars on, on the, the, the program will understand this as well. When you're working with oral histories, um, it's tough sometimes to pin down precisely what happened because you don't have real-time contemporary records. What we do know is that um, in a 1961 television broadcast, uh, John Kenneth Galbraith, uh, and the broadcast was out of the, about Vietnam, in fact, Galbraith would, would look back on this period in 61 and say of Kennedy, that Kennedy said to him, you know, you can only have so many, um, so many losses, or we can have only so many things go wrong in a single year. Um, and sooner or later, you got to turn things around. And, and 1961 was a pretty, pretty bad year, which also, I think, goes to what Kennedy was trying to say to uh, James Reston in the summer of 61. Look, we have to stand tall at some place. Yeah. And Vietnam is the place. Yeah. We're not going to do it in Laos. The Laotians aren't good timber. Uh, if you will, as as Kennedy and his advisors thought, to make a um, uh, an anti-communist stand, certainly militarily at the time, but the Vietnamese were uh, and and want to be, and so that's where we would plant the flag. It was very haunting. I know it is for everyone who hears it to listen to the tape uh, in which Kennedy recounts uh, just three weeks before his own assassination, the assassination of GM. Uh, talk a little bit. Uh, we have a, a questioner who's asking who was behind uh, 
that assassination. It certainly sounds as if the United States had some role in it. Talk a little bit about that and what consequence that had on our position relative to Vietnam afterwards. Sure, uh, the assassination is a, is a fascinating episode, uh, and it is not just encapsulated in what happens uh, on November first and number, November second. Nor even would I say, you know, back the the, the full week um, prior or even into the early part of October, but really into August uh, when the first uh, efforts to um, topple Goat and ZM are floated and considered explicitly by the United States. Uh, and the, the, the viewer mentioned Kennedy's remarks in, in uh, November reflecting on, on the coup. We have Kennedy's remarks during that last week of August in which he's thinking about the coup. Should we go ahead with it? Um, does this make a lot of sense? Is this in, in our best interest? What are we going to get after that? Who's going to run the show? Um, there is some real opposition to moving ahead uh, that uh, emerges initially, but ultimately, Kennedy will decide not only in August, but in October. And I think he is more partial to the coup in October than he is in August. I think he has more doubts in August than he does in October. That um, whatever uh, Whatever helps the counterinsurgency we support, whatever inhibits the counterinsurgency we don't support. And if removing ZM was going to help the war, he would be for it, but it had to succeed. The, the worst thing would be to launch a coup and have it fail. So if it's not going to succeed, or it looks like it's not going to succeed, succeed the United States should convey our understanding to those Vietnamese generals who were responsible for plotting the coup, but the green light or the yellow light or then the red light that the United States would provide was crucial because it was essential for those generals to know that American aid would still be forthcoming. Um, and that was really the bottom line. It was true in August and it was true in, in, in October. And, and once those signals went out that yes, the United States would support a successful coup, uh, then it was easier for the generals to move forward. And, and they did. And then Kennedy reflects on that, as, as the viewer said, in this uh, dictated memoir of uh, November 4th, in which he accepts, accepts responsibility for the coup, a, uh, a process, a decision-making process that he admits was flawed. Right. Um, and Mark Lawrence and I were talking a little bit earlier about decision-making processes. You know, Kennedy's decision-making process on Vietnam, I think, left something to be desired. I mean, for, for a series of officials, including, I don't know if you want to call them mid-level officials, but not the senior most officials, to be doing that kind of improvisation yeah. and, to be, and to be dictating American policy without a roundtable discussion of the key principles says something about the, the environment that you have structured. Right. And so I, I think that's important to to uh, to grasp as well when we think about Kennedy's approach to Vietnam. I saw a Professor Logville uh, make a point recently that one of the differences between President Kennedy and President Johnson is that President Kennedy would have been making <clears throat> these decisions in a second term. He wouldn't have been running for re-election, although you made a good point earlier, his brother might have been running for president, and he might have had to take that into account. But Johnson had uh, had a second, had it different. Um, uh, uh, Kennedy wouldn't have had, a, had another election, and Johnson did. Does that affect your thinking about whether Kennedy would have... Uh, I know you said earlier you, the, the balance you think was that he wouldn't have gotten out, but the fact that he would have been in the second term not having to run again, would that have maybe influenced him? Yeah, so um, so it is a key concern. I, I'll, I'll grant that. And I want to be careful with the language here because it is easier. It is easier for me to see Kennedy having gotten out 
than it would be for Lyndon Johnson to have taken steps to get out. Could could Johnson have done things differently? And Mark and I talked about that. And maybe there weren't as many opportunities given what and who LBJ was and, and, and the way that he saw things. I do think Kennedy would have remained engaged, though. I don't know how long a period he would have stayed that way. And I'm unclear on what that engagement would have looked yeah. like. But given what we know of where he was in the fall of 63, it would suggest that he was still committed to the fight. He was still committed to um, the brush fire wars that were going to be happening uh, in this development decade. Yes, Kennedy uh, offered, made this very stirring speech in the middle of June 63 at American University about the Soviet Union and the need for us to kind of re-examine our approach to uh, the Soviets and the Cold War, which was great and welcome. But Kennedy really didn't say anything about those lesser conflicts, the conflicts that were taking place in uh, in the shadows, uh, where you know they're they're no less dangerous, as Kennedy himself would say, because people are stabbed at night as opposed to people being killed on on the field of battlefield maneuver. So Kennedy still seemed to be concerned about these issues of credibility, about um, uh, the United States uh, being committed to its allies, about fighting the Cold War. Uh, at the time that he went to Dallas, and I still see him doing that in 64 into 65. Yes, his own electoral situation would have changed, and that might have changed his thinking to a degree. But again, as I said before, I think that there would have been concerns about Bobby, and there would have been concerns about the party as well. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's, there are third, fourth, fifth order of, of counterfactual magnitude here that we got to think about a whole host of concerns that, yeah. that would yeah. have worked together. I have a series of questions. We're running out of time about McNamara. Right. Uh, and I think I'm just going to let you run free a little bit with it. Uh, some who uh, wondered about his relationship with LBJ, he, he, uh, did he really believe that the South Vietnamese could win the war? Without U.S. troops, uh, could you unpack his relationship with LBJ? And then he, this idea that he came to Austin to, you know, to express his regrets for the war, and then he later uh, changes his mind about the war. Talk a little bit about McNamara, his his views throughout the period of time, and then the way he played out his change of mind at the end. Well, it is interesting to see McNamara evolve from where he was uh, with John F. Kennedy to where he was with Lyndon Johnson. I would even say he evolved during the time that he was with JFK. Uh, in the fall of 61, when Kennedy made the big decisions about uh, escalation, McNamara was among the more hawkish advisors who wanted Kennedy to make a firm commitment to support the South Vietnamese, no matter what, that we would stay with them essentially to, to the end. Kennedy wouldn't make that um, full commitment pledge. Uh, he was calling for the possibility of inserting over 200,000 troops. We need to be prepared to do that. Um, he then backed away from that by the time that Kennedy finally had to make those decisions a couple a, a week or so later in, in 61. And then he is the guy who essentially carries Kennedy's water for this withdrawal plan, seemingly kind of evolving from from where he was previously if you want to call it him uh becoming more dovish fine i suppose on on the on that spectrum and that he's implementing a policy that kennedy wants to pursue or or he's he's moving in a general direction that kennedy wants to go but i really think that the withdrawal policy is mcnamara's policy kennedy doesn't have a whole lot to do with it other than suggesting a general preference for, mm -hmm. for the trajectory of, of America's uh, profile. Once Kennedy is assassinated and, and, and McNamara is now serving Lyndon Johnson, that he's doing precisely that. He's serving Lyndon Johnson. And he's very much a person who believed that it was his job to realize the vision of the person who he was serving. And it became clear fairly early on that Johnson had struck 
a different tone or posture than Kennedy, uh, even if they weren't pursuing different policies, um, they would surely, but Johnson picks up on, uh, excuse me, McNamara picks up on Johnson's interest in greater urgency and greater intensity and runs with that, which leads him to, to become more energetic in thinking about taking you know, much more drastic action north of the 17th parallel, uh, and then canceling withdrawal altogether, uh, because that's really where LBJ wanted to go. And and yeah, I don't think Bob McNamara uh, believed that the war was winnable, I think, as the, the, the viewer said, with just, just the South Vietnamese. And, and by the end of 1965, we have reason to believe that he didn't think that the chances were really all that great that a military solution favorable to the West was in the cards either. And he becomes much more explicit about that into 1966. It wouldn't be until 1967, really the latter part of 67, that his judgment there, uh, that he would uh, allow himself to verbalize that judgment more forcefully with LBJ. And once he does, you know, his time with Johnson is up. Right. Let me ask you a final question. Mike Pistorius, who started a Navy career in the early 60s, he recalls conversations with contemporaries way back then about the idea that these insurgents could ultimately defeat the U.S. Was there a, how, how serious was the threat that uh, the, the, the North Vietnamese, the insurgents, could actually do what they ended up doing as early as night is the early 1960s. Uh, well, there was a real concern, uh, I would say, on the part of various people in the decision making bureaucracy, folks in the State Department, people who are working with, uh, there were a variety of task forces, Vietnam working groups that were very concerned about the South Vietnamese anti-communist, the ZM regime, as much as they were of the insurgents themselves uh, and the inability of the South Vietnamese to really offer a credible fighting force given the, the intense motivation that was being seen on the part of the Vietnamese communists. And it's, it's a motivation that the South was really never able to muster uh, mm -hmm. and they did not have a cause worth fighting for that equaled that of, of the, the indigenous Southern communists uh, and, and certainly the North Vietnamese who wanted to, to, to unify. So the fact that, that Mike is suggesting this seeing almost in, in, vac, in vacuum, the, 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 the potential of the insurgents themselves is interesting. I would, I would combine that, though, with what those insurgents were coming up against, which was the South Vietnamese forces, the, the Army, the Republic of, of Vietnam, and their American advisors, which a whole lot of people did have concerns about. McNamara, yes, was, was making repeated pronouncements of progress, particularly after the Strategic Hamlet program got going. But not everyone was so sanguine, and as we we learned once the Pentagon Papers out came in nineteen uh, came out in nineteen seventy one, we could see those those concerns out in 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 black and white. So, so yes, there was a concern about the way the war this the way the war would go, a belief in in ultimate defeat. I'm not so sure that that's what they were saying. But they believed it would be long and bloody, um, as other uh, counterinsurgencies had been long and bloody, depending upon how you want to date the, the Malayan um, insurgency, 48 to 60. That's 12 years. Even um, if we got involved, even if we got involved, there was yeah. that would have this. It was that powerful. Yeah. And 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 uh, and the the testimony that figures from Ambassador Nolting to uh, the State Department's April Harriman and, and others were, uh, were, were making were, were clear in that this is gonna be a long conflict or a, 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 certainly a three to five year conflict, hopefully nothing like an eight year conflict, 
but it's not going to be over anytime really soon. Professor, thank you so much. Fabulous. Learned so much. I know everybody in our audience was grateful to you for and great and grateful for having had the time to learn from you. I'll turn it back over to Phil Barnes. But Sam is exactly right. We could continue this conversation for hours, if not days. And Mark Lawrence and Sandy, too, thank you again for such a special time. As I note each week at this moment, many of us in the audience are members of UT Ali or of Friends of the LBJ Library, or perhaps both. If not, please check us out. Both of these organizations offer a variety of outstanding in-person and virtual programs, just much like the one that we share today. 